Last show was three things we do know. Now, three things we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals is currently constructed. Let's discuss. You are Locked On Cardinals. Your daily Arizona Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked on Cardinals, Alex Clancy here. Follow me on Twitter at Clancy's Corner. Follow the podcast at Locked on AZ Cards. Thank you for making Locked on Cardinals your first. Free wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Please go to the YouTube channel. Search Locked on Arizona Cardinals. Hit that subscribe button, man. Turn notifications on so you can see my big dumb face. You get notified. You get notified. Super easy. You know? Super simple. Um... So last show, three things we knew about the Arizona Cardinals. Three things we knew. Uh, go check that out. That was one of my uh, one of my favorite shows that I've done recently. Um, and uh, yeah, it's good. It's it speaks in you know generalities is the wrong term. It's a little bit more poignant than that. Um. Yeah, that was a good one. Okay, so. This one, three things we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals. And I'll give the disclaimer now. Bear with me here, okay? A lot of things we don't. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, okay? So let's speak in the current existential time that is us witnessing the rebuilding of the Arizona Cardinals and where we are on the timeline. The three things we don't know right now, okay? And there's one that's going to be based upon last year, or two, I believe, one and a half. One and a half is going to be based upon last year going into this year. And then one's going to be a little bit more general. One. And this is, yeah, this is the most important one, really, especially with where we've been over the last handful of years with this team and leadership, et cetera. And normally, like if I were doing, you know, uh, a four hour radio show or something. This would, this segment would be in the sweet spot right in the middle, but I'm going to give it to you right away. We don't know if Jonathan Gannon, Nick Rallis, and Drew Petson can do it when there's actual expectations and pressure. And I don't think that's unfair. I'm not saying one way or the other. Last year was a, very daunting task in the sense that they were undoing everything that the Cardinals have had known for the last four or five seasons. Everything. Slowly unraveling it. Monty Osford doing it with the roster. And Jonathan Gannon, Nick Rallis, and Drew Petzing collectively rebuilding from the studs up the entire foundation, bedrock, and everything else with this team and organization. And we saw it week one. Washington, they had no business being in that game, even though it was Sam Howell's first start there for you know this season. I think he had started spotty the, the couple of years before. Josh Dobbs hadn't been with the team for two years. They were completely devoid of talent on the defensive side of the ball, and it was a new offense. And they hung with them. Super ugly game. Could have won. Josh Dobbs, I think, put it on the ground twice that game that ended up sealing it. But we knew for the majority of us, right away, that this was different. We knew the majority of us that this was different. And then they were blowing out the Giants. They blew out Dallas in the back-to-back home games, week two and three. And it's like, what is this? There's no talent on this team. How is this happening? So throughout the year, while it wasn't pretty always, while they had collapses in the second half, while the defense wasn't able to hold up for 60 minutes the majority of games, and while Kyler Murray was out for a large portion of the season, we still saw the same positives showing up every game. They showed up to play. Unbelievable thought. They were prepared. Unbelievable thought. They were playing for each other. They were playing as a cohesive unit, and it didn't matter who was on offense or defense or who the hell was quarterback. 
this team was playing with a pep that we hadn't seen during the entirety of the Cliff Kingsbury era. I don't even care about the games that they won in the beginning of 2021, how they started hot in 2020. It wasn't an if, it was a when. Last year, it looked sustainable. And it was weird. And it was different. And it was awesome. After the Cowboys game, I think... I think I said this, that that was the most fun I've had in a week on this podcast. Because it wasn't just a reckless abandon playing, playing with reckless abandon. It wasn't just that they were beating a team that gave up like one point before that game. It was, they were fun to watch. And I think a lot of it had to do with, I think a lot of it, a lot of it had to do with Drew Petsy's offense, where it's, there was a metronome there. You know, it was, there was cadence. It wasn't just putting a blindfold on, having, you know, eating 12 pixie sticks as a kid and just running around hoping the offense worked. Like what we were experiencing before. Pivot to now. There were no expectations last year. The only expectations were make this a team again. Make this a team that play hearts. Make this a team that believes. And they did. And I think that's pretty clear. Uh, it, it wasn't perfect, obviously, but you've got to compare it to what it was for a second. You're like, look at what it was. Look at what it is now. Now, and I've said this multiple times, what it is now in a vacuum would still have gotten praise. But it magnifies it coming from what it was. Pivot to now. Now you got to do it. Now you got to win games. And it depends on what they do in the draft. It depends on what they do in the remainder of the free agency. Because this team still needs a lot of talent. <laughs> like, there's no question about that. There is no strength on this team aside from running back room and, you know, Buda Baker and Jalen Thompson. Truly. There's no true strength. The offensive line is massively improved over the last couple of seasons. But they don't have any corners. They have no interior defensive linemen stars. They have no pass rush. They have no wide receivers, star wide receivers. We'll see what happens with Michael Wilson, you know, whatever it may be. That's a lot of holes, you know, May, June, July. Uh, four months, four and a half months away from week one of, of uh, preseason. Now there are going to be expectations, non-Super Bowl expectations, maybe not even playoff expectations. But the Cardinals are looking, even though I think the over-under six and a half for them, with Kyler Murray at quarterback, and say they do draft Marvin Harrison Jr. This offense will be good enough with James Conner to be able to put up some points and keep them in games. They were in, like last year, they could have won seven or eight games legitimately. They could have won seven or eight games, which would have been a nightmare now. For those that are happy they beat Philly, cool. They also would have had the number three overall pick this year. And for those that are upset that Matt Prater missed that field goal against um, Seattle, that kick single-handedly handed the Cardinals the opportunity to draft Marvin Harrison Jr. So, not bad. They have to do it now. And listen, this is very surface-level lists right now because we're, you know, so many other things need to happen before we get into the middle of summer when things actually really start to mold into shape. What what Jonathan Gannon, Drew Petty, and Nick Rowles did last year was so much better than what anybody could have expected, in my opinion. Now, if they're able to build from that zero to one jump that they made last year, this year, to that next big step when they actually have some talent, Kyler Murray's healthy all year, you hope. Who knows? Because with that foundation, that is a strong, structured leadership foundation. You add talent to that. Who knows? But they got to do it. Can they? We don't know. We will come this time next year. We do not know. And it's exciting 
so much more than scary at this point. And that's a hell of a good thing with a team on rebuild. Alex Nancy locked on Cardinals. What is the second thing that we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals? I'll discuss it next. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps you ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. Alex Clancy here. Thanks for hanging out. Hope you're having a good week. Every dayers, thank you for being around. Some of you since 2017. Uh, if this is your first listen to Locked on Cardinals, thank you. Maybe make Monday or second. It's only going to get more fun from here. It's only going to get more fun. Two weeks away from the draft. I'll reintroduce <laughs> the draft next week. I mean, come on. Like, the Marvin Harrison Jr. thing is, it's important. This is what's going to shape the next handful of years for the team. But there are only so many angles you can discuss it with. Close enough. There's only so many ways you can discuss this. And we're exactly two weeks away. Well, you know, 13 days away from the draft. And we have less idea of what's going to happen now than what we did a month ago. It's the wildest thing. But, you know, things that we don't know about the team, this isn't a podcast being done in week eight of the next of next season, which is good. This is very early on. It's really an exercise. You know, I like doing my exercises. And this is just another one. One thing we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals, and this is almost – Almost as important, especially with the rosters currently constructed, as the first one with, with, with the coaches and their ability to you know snowball over the momentum they had for the entirety of last year, pretty much with the culture build, you know, and everything like that. We don't know if last year's rookies are going to be able to level up because of how fragile, and I use that term a lot or word a lot. Because of how fragile this roster is and because of how there isn't much depth in very important positions, it is more important now than a long time for second-year players to take that step up. And with the Cardinals now, this is much, much different than what it was. This isn't – and listen, I'm using this for context – the way that Steve Kime would build rosters is, you know, we'd sign or trade for, you know, veteran talent. And it wouldn't ever really be an even keeled roster talent wise. And then you have to draft players and put them in and make them perform right away because you don't have the depth of veterans in those specific positions to allow them to learn the game naturally. The NFL game that is, I mean, Byron Murphy, key example, Isaiah Simmons, Zayvon Collins, key examples. Marco Wilson is the most recent. Like Marco Wilson, they traded up, got him in the fourth round, and just plug and play. He was never a CB1 or CB2. And with injuries and such, he moved into CB1 role last year. It's like, it's, it's Looney Tunes. But this is different. These unknowns are good unknowns to have. Because if you knew the answer already, probably isn't a good thing. So, Paris Johnson Jr., Mixed reviews for him from last year. I kind of see it under the guise of it wasn't bad. And there was a lot of good. And as a rookie who moved to the right side of the line, learning a brand new position, played pretty damn well. Played pretty damn well. 
And it wasn't the, and I've said this a lot this week, I apologize, but you know, it's necessary. The, oh no, he's not ready moments. There weren't really any of those, especially against some of the best fronts in football. I mean, come on. Washington, when they were all there, uh, Dallas, during the first month of the season, those two teams, he had to face Montez Sweat again when they played Chicago. Like, he did a very good, he had Aaron Donald twice a year. And they didn't always line up on the same sides, but, or he didn't always line up on the same side, but, you know, you go after the rookie and he held his up one. BJ Ojolari, this is even more of a TBD, really came on late. Was injured to start the season. Uh, everybody that I've had on, you know, draft experts uh, talk about this year as we, you know, reflect on last year, his bend. That's all they, that's what they talk about. His bend off the edge is something to behold. So a second year with him, and hopefully he'll have some help from the pass rush position to make his job easier. Hopefully he'll have some help from the interior of the defensive line that maybe crumbles the pocket a little bit, making it easier to get to the quarterback, tackles for losses off the edge. That's another one where it's like Parrish Johnson Jr. and him, you see potential to be pro bowlers in them. Parrish Johnson Jr. more, in my opinion, um, and it's still very early. And B.J. Ojolari showed enough last year where it's like, okay, he's got the goods. Now he needs some help, not just off the edge of the opposing side, but the interior defensive line to be able to, you know, maybe keep the interior of the offensive, opposing offensive line a little bit more honest. That's two. And these are the ones that are trickier for me. Let's let's throw in Dante Stills, okay? Six-round pick, played fine in the interior defensive line, was arguably the best interior defensive lineman the Cardinals had. John Ledbetter was okay. He was pretty good, and then he got hurt. A lucky foe, too, not great. Rashard Lawrence was cut before the season started. Like, they need help in the interior defensive line. They've got it now. Dante Stills played pretty well last year, okay? Honorable mention, but I'm namely talking about the top, the top four guys. These two, injury-wise, mars this a little bit. Michael Wilson showed flashes. What I discussed with him and Garrett Williams are the game never looked too too fast for them, which is huge from the wide receiver and cornerback positions, respectively. It is. Michael Wilson showed flashes. Michael Wilson showed people what we saw on tape before he was drafted and when he was drafted, that he catches everything on the outside, it seems. He's got a great catch radius. He's big. He runs routes inside. He runs routes outside. He's a good red zone threat. Like... If the dude can stay healthy, you could be looking at a fringe wide receiver one there, like a, I don't know, a T. higgins kind of figure, not in the style of play. But if they bring in a wide receiver one, you're like, well, is T. Higgins a wide receiver one? Well, is Michael Wilson a wide receiver one? Something like that. That's a trajectory that we saw when he was healthy. And that's the purpose of this segment. You're like, well, listen, injuries, college injuries, injuries last year. We don't know. Like, this is the one thing about injuries that's difficult with a team that's losing a lot. I'm not saying that there isn't validity to players' injuries ever. I would never question somebody's health and why they're sitting. And bad teams have injured players for longer at times. Especially when it's, you know, end of the season, you know, one player get hurt, have an injury that's going to maybe swipe them out for the entirety of the next year. Um, but when he played... He he had an offer with Kyler, and then they started to get some momentum. I mean, him, Greg Dorch, and Trey McBride really were starting to hum with Kyler Murray. And then Garrett Williams is the most fascinating one of the four for me because the Cardinals haven't had a CB1 in a long time. 2017, maybe, when Patrick Peterson was good. That's six years. That's a long time. And even when Patrick Peterson was good, they never had a CB2 aside from Antonio Cromartie in 2014, uh, 10 years ago. So if Garrett Williams can be healthy, he's coming off the injury in college, came in, played pretty well. I get a couple picks, played pretty well. The game wasn't too fast for him. He wasn't getting burned like Isaiah Simmons was getting burned, even though it's a different position. He wasn't getting burned like Cattrall Clark was getting burned. He wasn't getting burned. He was playing football with other NFL players in his rookie year, off an injury with a defense that was pretty much devoid of talent. No pass rush, no interior defensive line pressure. And he played fine. So when you have those two guys, those two third-round picks, we don't know if that level up happens in year two. That's one of the 
biggest question marks going into this season upcoming. Because if they do, say four out of three out of four of them really level up and become like, oh, yep, they're Arizona Cardinals and they continue playing like this, they're going to all get second contracts. The Cardinals are going to be in wildly better shape than if it's just Paris Johnson Jr. Or if Michael Wilson can't stay healthy. Or if Garrett Williams regresses. Especially if they don't bring any other talent aside from Sean Murphy bunting into the cornerback room. The interesting part about three of these four, Bijo Ojolari, Garrett Williams, and Michael Wilson, they all need help in their positions. They all need help to be able to allow them to level up. They need help in the pass rush, help in the cornerback room, help in the wide receiver room. So the second thing that we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals as of right now is how much can you trust the rookies from last year who are set to be high-impact guys? And I started the segment by saying the fact that we don't know as opposed to, oh, no, it's an outside chance is a good thing. It's a good thing. What's the final thing we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals right now? No, it's not who are they going to draft it for. I could take that layup. I could take that easy way out, kind of nuance myself into a draft segment. I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. What's the third thing we don't know? I'm going to talk. I'll tell you next. Chill. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. Final segment, Locked on Cardinals. Alex Clancy here. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen, free wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team. Every day. So here's the thing, everybody. Um, you know, when we when we talk about the Cardinals, where they are now, combined with last year and what it's going to crunch into in 2024 during the 2024 season, And say in the comments and, and, you know, comment, whatever, YouTube, whatever it may be. Does it, doesn't it feel like there's a clear path? We just don't know what the exact path is yet. You know what I mean? Where it's like, we didn't, we had no idea what Steve Kahn was going to do. Complete wild card. No idea. Where it's like, well, let's hope he learns from his mistake from last year. That was kind of the path. And it's not a knock, just kind of what we were thinking. Now it's like, okay, so last year wasn't great win-loss record-wise. Offense looked pretty good. Uh, defense, nah, they played a lot better than people thought, especially with, with, with the talent disparity. Uh, Jonathan Gannon seems to be a you know, likable guy who's got a good hold on the team. Monty Osport seems to be a good you know, um, judger of talent and scout and things like that. And, um, and Kyler Murray seemed to you know, really enjoy – his time last year, whether he was playing or not, and give a little bit more introspection to his life. And him and Jonathan Gannon really seemed to like each other. Like, we're seeing, and then, you know, the rookies played pretty well. Well, it wasn't great, but they played pretty well. And if they can expound upon that year two and year three, the Cardinals have their foundation for the future. You know, things like that. Like, things that, things that we would have yearned for three or four years ago are just what we experienced. It's like, oh, um, you know, it's not, it's not super sexy. It's not, you know, it's not the, it's not the Hale Murray. And, you know, it's not Kyler Murray coming back from, you know, multiple scores down in the second half against the Raiders and getting a win two years ago. It's not that. But it's, it's like life by a thousand cuts. The opposite of cuts. You know? It's different. And just like that, a microcosm of that on the field, and this is the biggest one for me. I know that the coach, and I, like, it's the biggest one, and the rookies are second. Like, it is. But for me, with actual gameplay, what was the anchor last year of this team? The run game. Can that be replicated? That's my biggest I don't know. That's my biggest I don't know of the three. The first two probably mean more in theory because you're going to have Kyler Murray coming back. And, you know, it's it's just that's what it is. Um, 
But if they – like, they don't need to be top 10. You know, it doesn't have to be that, especially with Kyler Murray coming back. But if they can run the ball effectively like they did last year, infuse talent on the Cardinals' defense – and have a little bit more talent on offense. They already brought in Jonah Williams. You know, they're going to bring another running back, whether it be Michael Carter or somebody else. They're going to have more talent from the wide receiver position. Kyler Murray is going to be healthy. If that is the staple of this team, this team was awful last year on paper. And then a top 10 run offense, you would think of, of either of them would be a top 10 pass offense because they'd be behind by 30 points every game and have to throw the ball. That was the biggest surprise. Like, here's the thing. James Conner's great. Okay, love James Conner. That was an incredible signing. One year, 1.2 mil, I think, was the beginning. And then he got his extension. Everybody's like, oh, it's too much. No, it's not. And I hope they extend him again. He has no guaranteed money after this year. He needs to retire in Arizona Cardinal. I'll do my James Conner discussions during the summer. It's, he needs to be the LeGarrette Blunt of this team for the next five years. Okay, that's all. That's all. If this run game, even without Kyler Murray being a huge integral part of it, which is the goal, right? You'd, you'd love to run the ball with running backs and have the quarterback throw the ball. Ideally, I know that it, that's never going to be the case because he's so, you know, he's so quick and so good at what he does. He knows his space. He knows his size. He knows how to stay and, and take as, as few hits as possible. Like, I get all that. But they, need, they used to rely on it. They used to rely on James Conner. They used to rely on Kyler Murray running the ball, which is not how you build an offense. So the third biggest thing that we don't know is, is that rush attack replicable? Can you do it again? When the rest of the NFL knows it's coming. They knew it was coming towards the second half of last year. Couldn't stop it. And that's why I've been pounding the table for a real RB2 who used to maybe be an RB1 who could come in and be the real one-two punch of James Conner. M Michael Carter was fine. And maybe they found him and maybe he's the guy. Maybe he is. But if you have Kyler Murray throwing the ball 20 times a game and they run the ball, you know, 170, 175 yards a game and they win games, like who cares? Kyler Murray doesn't need to put up 400 yards and four touchdowns a game to make the contract worth it. And I think that's something that people don't really understand or don't like they look just at his numbers and not it, it's we're going to talk about that more as well as, as the season ramps up. Can Jonathan Gannon, Nick Rallis and Drew Petzing continue the implementation that they started last year and did at such a great level? Can the rookies from last year, soon to be second year players level up? like we see the trajectory could be from all four of them taken in the first three rounds. And can the Cardinals continue the rush attack to act as the metronome for this offense and set up the great blue yonder of Trey McBride, Marvin Harrison Jr. If he's here, Michael Wilson, Greg Dortch, etc. Even if the Cardinal, and this is one of my, this is one of my um, checklist items of why they should trade back if they're getting offered three first-round picks. This offense doesn't necessarily need a wide receiver one to work. Okay. A little teaser for Monday. Even if they draft Marvin Harrison Jr. at four. There's a lot more plays run now than you know ever before in the NFL. If they're a run-first team, imagine – how honest having Marvin Harrison Jr. on the outside would make this the opposing defenses, which would yield less stacked boxes, which would yield even better rush attack, and then set up the play action like this team hasn't seen in a long time. Like, if the Cardinals could run the ball like they did last year with more talent on both sides of the ball, all bets are off for how many games they could win next year. Truly. And... Unlike the things we don't know about the Arizona Cardinals, we were talking mid-season about that for years on end. Now talking about it as, I don't know, could be pretty good. It's kind of where we're at now, and it's been a hell of a shift over the last 14 or 16 months, and I'm here for it. Alex Nancy, Locked on Cardinals. Remember, without you, there is no me. Hope you have a good weekend. I'll talk to you Monday.